So you logged in as Harry? I'm, uh, yeah, um, I'm always logged in as Harry. In fact, it's kind of my shtick to like Change. rename myself. Yesterday, nobody commented that I was Stingray. <laughs> I noticed it and then I forgot. <laughs> Let's see. What should I be? I don't know. It's been a wild week, dude. <laughs> totally. Okay, there we go. Wild style. I'll be wild style. <laughs> there you go. How many Ys are you putting in? Oh, that's a great call. Let's see. <laughs> you know what? Let's have some fun, Jordan. We don't have enough fun anymore. <laughs> I know. Actually... What the hell? <laughs> Remember when we used to have fun? We used to like have time to watch surreptitiously procured bang sales videos and just laugh. <laughs> yeah. And joke and G chat. Remember now, that? Remember? Now, now it's nothing yeah. but work. Bro, when did this happen? It's been <laughs> insane. It's been insane. It's crazy. I think that uh, that news sets us up nicely for this conversation, though. So, yeah, totally, totally. And yeah, you, know, you run point on this. Who knows if Harry is going to join us or not? For our listening and audience, Harry has been sick this week more than usual. So. You know, you More might just get usual. us. <laughs> My, it's sick with a Y. <laughs> he's usually sick with a Y. This week he's sick with an I. So, all right, I'll get, I'll let our guests in, and Jordan, you can take it away. We'll, cool. we'll fit the all your dreams come true in somewhere. Yo, yo, Michael and Ethan, how are you? I am uh, glad to be home. I've been on the road for six days. So, Ooh. oh man. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a vacation. <laughs> well, I came back and then the next morning left for business and then okay. came back to another trip. And But now I'm back uh, for a while. Nice. How are you like, guys doing? Busy. We were just talking about how, geez, for like the last, I don't know, what, year? It's just been nonstop. As you know, obviously, yeah. and, you know, that's, that's good for you, I suppose, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, these are good times for us. Somebody, well, let, while you guys are, are retooling over there, let me welcome you to Beernet Radio, where all your dreams come true, <laughs> as Harry loves to say. So yeah, you guys want to uh, introduce yourselves and uh, start us off here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Ethan Steenstra here, and uh, I've been in the craft beer business, but also the adult beverage business, I call it now. That's kind of where we're heading, right? And I've uh, been in it for roughly 30 years. Uh Started as a route sales guy in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, and uh, in the early '90s. And uh, from there, I I linked up with the Red Hook Brewery, which became the Red Hook Widmer Kona uh, Craft Brands Alliance Group, and uh, happened to open up the brewery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, for Red Hook, and went into marketing there, uh, and reported to the VP of marketing at Red Hook, and then uh, got tapped on the shoulder. Uh, by the Coors Brewing Company. They had this little brand called Blue Moon um, and uh, worked on Blue Moon from basically 05 to 2014-ish um, and saw that brand blow up. I also did stints in innovation for Miller Coors during that merger. And uh, and then uh, from there, I went to go work at New Belgium Brewery uh, and helped them uh, with innovation and portfolio strategy, was there six years, left in 2020 during COVID, um, really enjoyed working from home. And my one and a half hour commute to Fort Collins was uh, was a difficult one. So uh, I uh, so then I uh, joined forces with Dan Kiefer, who's one of the top creatives in adult beverages. Uh, Dan worked on Coors Banquet with the Integer Group, an agency. He also helped me with Blue Moon. Uh, he was the VP of creative for Canarchy for several years. Um, and he and I joined forces and, and started ahead of the curve strategy. And um, the, the, the premise between behind ahead of the curve strategy is we saw a need for uh, craft brewers to get younger. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we do is we, we kind of relook at brand um positioning and we call it a brand identity model and that's where we start and then from there we get into strategy and creative and while we were doing that um we noticed e-commerce becoming a big big thing and obviously drizzly and instacart um, and gopuff and they started blowing up and so we started doing 
tactical things around that and then realized that um, there was a big need for uh, digital shelving is what we're calling it. But that's stage one of e-commerce. And I'll get into that. But basically, we saw a new premise called the e-premise is what we called it. That's the name of the company um, where we help adult beverage clients, big and small, look great on shelf. So we're we're basically digital merchandisers in the sky, if you want to call it that. Um, and that's kind of the e-premise group. While I was doing that, uh, and this is, again, still during COVID, I started having beers with Michael Richter, who's on the screen now. Um, hey, Michael. And Hello, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, we joined forces uh, as well to, to help companies like Achieve Dreams, mostly with M&A needs. And I'll let Michael speak to that. Yeah. Well, quick. When do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I have a lot of people uh, working with me, a lot of former um, Coors and Miller Coors folks. Um, you know, I'm in Denver with Dan, um, and there's a lot of us uh, veterans here that uh, uh, have a lot of time on our hands to do things. And so I've, I've actually... Uh, pick the best of the best, if you will, to work with. And it's been, it's incredible. It's been great. So the Rolodex is gigantic, whether it's uh, uh, mechanical engineering, we have a, we have a, we have that person who are, who are helping clients with um, creative, uh, making commercials, uh, point of sale. It's all here in Denver uh, since, you know, there was a big move to Chicago with Miller Coors. So there's a lot of talent here that we're tapping into. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. No, no worries. Hello, I'm Michael Richter, uh, GLC Advisors. Yes, Ethan, uh, we connected easily over a few beers a few years ago and decided to kind of partner up and look for ways that we could help the adult beverage community and and then <clears throat> and really anything that touches that. So suppliers, distributors, manufacturers, uh, beverage company producers themselves, Beyond Beer, you, you name it. So I've been doing M&A for probably 15 years, mergers and acquisitions, and and uh, focus really with founder owner entrepreneurs, uh, helping them either raise capital, um, whether that's through, you know, <clears throat> the financial community or help them transition their business um, into the hands of others or really anything strategically related to kind of <clears throat> the financing markets or mergers and acquisitions, that sort of stuff. So, but, and, and as you guys know, we just recently closed the, the Melvin transaction uh, right. in, in Jackson, Wyoming. Uh, where we sold merged Melvin with uh, Roadhouse Brewery. Right. So we have these fine gentlemen here to talk a little bit about trends, M and A, uh, and a little e-commerce too. I think with the breaking news that just hit of New Belgium acquiring Constellations old Ballast Point production facility in Virginia, that kind of sets this conversation up nicely, I think. And so let's let's start with craft. Right now, it's kind of all about IPAs and high ABV, thanks, it seems, in large part to Voodoo. But what's next for that segment? So I, I see IPAs growing for a couple more years. Obviously, it's, it's fragmenting within that segment, if you will. Um, and you're seeing fruit and flavors. And I was at your, your summit in, at the Breakers, and, and we heard a lot about flavors um, and what's happening with other CPG categories. I see that. Uh, happening. And then I kind of think Venn diagram and um, and higher ABV uh, products coupled with fruit and IPAs. Uh, and you're seeing it with, with Voodoo, but you're going to see a, a whole host of other uh, high ABV IPAs. Um, so that's that's where I see the trend going. Um, and obviously 19.2, cracking the code uh, big time on that. Um, so you'll see that coupled. And it's not just C-Store, although gigantic channel for beer that's never really been tapped into by craft, but we're seeing grocery stores and obviously venues with it. So th those are, those are two of the trends I see with IPAs going on. Yeah. And you mentioned high ABV, high fruit kind of forward flavors. Does that kind of push craft brewers that haven't got into beyond beer, maybe to kind of get them to think a little more about making that jump, you think? No doubt about it. Um, almost everyone that I'm speaking to is trying to figure out how to way to do it and to do it the right way, and uh, to be able to produce it in the right way, if you will. You, you you need some equipment to be able to produce these type of beers. So, 
there's a lot that goes into it, but yeah, I, I don't see it slowing down. I see other high ABV products coming along soon as well. That might be outside the category of IPAs, but still within beer. Interesting. Okay. And then kind of going back to the voodoo, because I think everything kind of goes back to voodoo right now in craft. You know, some brand families are hot, others aren't. What makes that difference? And, you know, what's unique about voodoo? You know, um, I, I'm a fan of of, of uh, brand families for a big reason. And, and the reason why is, it's a, to me, it's a consumer communication piece where, uh, you know, when I go to Chicago or the Northeast or California, um, and I walk into a, a, a Kroger or a big grocery chain, I I, I kind of get nauseous. I can't, I don't understand what I'm seeing. I don't understand the brands because there's so many of them. Um, and I feel like if if I'm an industry vet and I, I'm having that situation, then consumers are too. And where brand families really like uh, help uh, consumers with messaging is, if they've got a strong IPA brand like Voodoo, um, they uh, they get that it's an IPA line. Um, and so it's not a big leap to go, oh, that's the Voodoo brand architecture. I'm going into the Imperial or I'm going into the Fruited line or things of that sort, as long as it's, to me, uh, consistent with the, 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 the style segment, if you will. So I think once you leave the style segment, um, the consumer can can become confused pretty quickly. And I had a follow-up there is judging by the brands growing in craft, we've seen, it feels like uh, brewers have more luck with creating new brand families than extending off some of their own brand families. I think it, it's really difficult to create a brand from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why there's a temptation to do it under a, a, a brand, if you will, that might not be jiving communication wise with the consumer, if you will. Um, and so it's it's really easy to sell on a product that may be adjacent segment wise because of the brand halo, but it, to me, it causes instant confusion if it's not consistent with the segment, if you will. You know, lots of interesting things over the last couple minutes that you've said. Uh, first of all, let me back up. You know, you mentioned that you were at New Belgium and obviously we've talked a lot about Voodoo Ranger. Uh, you were there during the sale then, right? I was. And I'm just curious, like, do you think the company itself, the culture, do you think a lot of it has changed? And, and do you think that's related to the Voodoo success at all? I'm, I'm so curious if it's the same company, really. You know, that's a good question. Um, it's it's I've it, it's going on two plus years since I was there. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a lot has changed. Um and a lot of the folks that were uh, in the creation part of Voodoo are, are no longer with the company, um, but they've, they've taken that baton and ran with it nicely. I have to compliment them there. And, um, you know, they're doing, they're making a lot of the right moves. And um, I think, you know, they, they're really good um, at, at, at where the younger consumer is. And, and that's uh, in the e-commerce area. We're calling it social commerce as well which, you know, we can speak to later in the call, but that that's, they, they're, they're tapping into the younger consumer and that's where I think craft needs to go. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Cause again, you, you guys have so many things to talk about where we should go next, but let me ask about, you know, since you brought up the e-premise, I'll try and move the conversation there a little bit. Who exactly are you working with? Like what size, I guess, producers, are you working both on the producer side for them to get their brands, you know, camera ready on that digital shelf? Are you also working on the retailer side? And also how do you make sure that they, you know, have these best practices in mind? Because as a consumer, I can't tell you how many times I have ordered a product that's not a flagship and I get the wrong product from Instacart or Drizzly for beer because I, I don't know if it's the suppliers or if it's the retailers that's not keeping up on the digital shelf, right? Yeah. It's happened a lot lately. So I'm curious, do you help align that too? Great question. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's what the e-premise mainly does. Um, we work with large brewers. Okay. Um, we also have wineries. We also have RTD companies. Um, we're working with uh, a top five brewer that, uh, globally. Um, and we're working with some small uh, brewers that are only in one state. And then you you asked the best question I've heard yet on e and it starts with the digital shelf. And uh, so we all know bricks and mortar. Um, and, you know, you you got the picture of, of the distributor guy, right? And he's facing bottles or cans. 
same with wine, maybe a duster, and same with with spirits, right? Um, but what what uh, happens a lot when we're having conversations with with brewers, many brewers, most of the big ones have a good idea of what's going on in the world, but the the medium sized to smaller ones and RTDs, you ask who's merchandising your digital shelf. And there's a big blank stare and they're like, what do you mean by that? And that's all the responsibility of the supplier. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's where we start. That's ground zero. And then um, once we have you looking uh, well, and so we're the merchandisers and we help companies and it's not a lot of work. Um, even the the one I was mentioning, the, the biggest client we have, which is a top five brewer in the US, um, I think it's about 80 hours of work for a year. Um, so you don't hire a person for 80 hours of work. You, you, you can hire us and we'll do it quickly and efficiently for you. Um, but once we go from there, then we're like, okay, now people, consumers need to find you, right? Um, and that's search and that's Google and that's on Instacart or GoPuff or uh, on Drizzly. And that's where it becomes more marketing and you're, this is a marketing dream because only 25% of consumers are shopping beer by brand. Um, wine is even lower, 5%. They're shopping by style, Merlots, Cabernets. Um, and Spirits actually is doing the best job of branding. They're about 50-50. So Tito's or Absolute. So you can really like uh, influence a consumer's behavior on what to shop for. And, and when I say shop, it's not just, just uh, uh, delivery. And that's dropped off significantly since mm -hmm. COVID. Um, what people are using e-com for is learning about brands and finding out pricing and where it's close to their house. And maybe it's a pack size. And then they're going to bricks and mortar or having a curbside pickup. That's what we're seeing. Interesting. Um, and then the third thing is where we, we help with uh, social commerce. And this is the biggest thing that I am excited about. And that is um, everyone's on their phones, especially young people. Um, and you have a real big chance to influence people on the Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or, well, let's say TikTok, not yet, <laughs> um, Snapchat, YouTube, yeah. um, by by basically showing them your brand and then they can find out more through that social medium. Mm -hmm. uh, and retailers love it. They're investing in it and it's going nuts right now. Target, uh, Walmart, Kroger, they're all investing in digital rate. And I think we saw on some of AB's Super Bowl spots, they would even have the QR code on the spot where you could just, you know, scan it and it would take you right to it. Is that something you see more and more yeah. brewers incorporating? Yeah. And so you can't really do that on your TV when you're watching something. <laughs> Going to have to pause it first and then <laughs> go over there. <laughs> yeah. One day. But right. Yeah. Uh, smart TVs, right? Um, no, there's, there's a shop now button. Um, and you can instantly go straight to a digital shelf to a store near you, um, which is super exciting. And you mentioned, uh, you know, we've seen somewhat of a slowdown since COVID. But what have you learned about the um, the shopping behavior since COVID and like the stickiness of uh, e-commerce um, since uh, then? It's it's slowed down, um, but just delivery. Um, what we're seeing is a big uptick in curbside. But to me, the the big story is. People are using uh, the e-premise to find brands, research brands, shop brands, and then they'll skip the, the high cost of delivery or the minimums, especially in this inflationary uh, environment that we're in. Um, one thing we are seeing for delivery, though, is super premium and high premium brands are still, uh, we see an uptick there, but on the premiums and the below premiums, uh, definitely you're seeing foot traffic to the bricks and mortar through social commerce and e-commerce. Gotcha. Uh, let's talk a little bit about M&A. And I understand that you launched uh, a new enterprise focused on M&A, M&A, adult beverage ventures. So um, I formed a... Uh-oh. <laughs> That's All right. okay. We'll, Mike... dub, we'll dub over him. <laughs> yeah. Michael, back to you. So yeah. let's talk let's talk a little bit about M A. And um, you know, I'm just I'm curious, what's attractive to buyers right now? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, craft is is having a moment where um there is, you know, over nine thousand breweries. Uh it's a crowded marketplace. And I would say, you know, with the the Melbourne transaction, we actually have a couple other things in the works 
having some good insight as to what folks are looking for. And it's, you know, obviously, you know, 16 to 19 was the heyday. Things have kind of slowed a little bit. One thing, interestingly, is the the financial acquires essentially have pulled away from the market, um, where if you look in 1920, 21, there were still a handful of, of financial acquires in the space. And um, if you look at 22 uh, of the 25 transactions, none of them included a you know financial acquire. So it's really at this moment, it's strategic to strategic. So when an acquirer is, is looking uh, to make an acquisition, it's, you know, for they're being more selective, first and foremost, uh, obviously, with New Belgium's announcement, obviously, production is key. Um, there is a some folks have a lot of demand, so others who may, may have overbuilt have a lot of uh, capacity for production, but don't quite have the demand. So there's kind of a mismatch of of what's in demand versus some that have production and and don't. So production is key. Some of the larger ones are looking for more well-established brands um, that, you know, have a toehold on a market or a region that have good good distribution. Um, Distribution is another key or specific products that fit their portfolio. There's been a lot of talk about Beyond Beer and RTDs. And so instead of, you know, some breweries just don't have the capacity or the the team on the R&D side to come up with new products and things so they can look at that other products that, that fit their portfolio. Um, and I would say the overarching, overarching angle is just different ways to compete, right? To be competitive, to stay relevant, to make sure those, you know, it, it, the, the acquisitions are more strategic in nature right now. Have the valuations come down from, the, I would assume, from the heyday or? Oh, yes. Yeah, they have. It, but it's interesting because you know, if you look at some of the most recent transaction, there's not a ton of data available. Um, some are skewing the numbers because, you know, they they demanded high valuation. So it's really dependent on size and production and distribution, all those types of things. Yeah. yeah. And, and in this environment, obviously recessionary and it's certainly inflationary. Um, is that, Has that helped to slow deal flow too, I would assume? Yeah, I think a lot of people, um, you know, that are maybe looking to transition their business or have decided to kind of hold on and, and go back to the grindstone and, you know, maybe introduce a new product or, or something along those lines. So when we see, you know, those financial acquires leave an industry, sometimes it, it slows things down, but yes, generally speaking. Yeah. Um, one thing I didn't hear was tap rooms and obviously since COVID, you know, that's kind of been up and down. Um, but, you know, that used to be a, very attractive thing to buyers. Um, where do tap rooms kind of fit into a deal nowadays? Is that a, a good thing or a bad thing? It's an interesting space or in, in conversation where if tap rooms are great, we're seeing a lot more folks add on-premise food. Um, we've met with probably tons of breweries in the last 12 months. And those that don't have food or is something they're adding just because they're good margins there. And if they're bringing in consumers to, you know, consume their products, that's an easy add on to help with profitability, those types of things. So we see, you know, these corner tap rooms that are anchors in community is, you know, very beneficial for the community. They tend to have good margins and they make money. The issue is, you know, getting from a corner tap room to kind of scaling to a, you know, maybe your 5,000 barrel brewery. How do you get to 10, 15, 20, 25,000, you know, those types of things. But tap rooms are, are very attractive, especially if it, and if there's, you know, on-premise food as well. Um, but a lot of it's just contingent on the buyer, what they're looking for, if it's strategic or not, you know, all those sorts of things. Okay. The, the Ballast Point old facility today, um, we've seen AB kind of scale back their craft and Molson Chorus has done the same. Are the days of big brewers buying craft brewers, is that kind of in the rear view? I think they're just being more selective. I think you'll see a handful of announcements here or there, but again, you know, a lot of them are focused on production or maybe they're digesting an acquisition. So I, I, it's not as active of a market as it once was, but I, I don't think it's over. I just think there'll be fewer and further between where there's got to be a strategic reason behind, you know, the acquisition. Yeah. Um, Go I'll ahead. jump in there too. And and the, the folks that we've spoken with, um, they're definitely looking for uh, brands that are built and are selling and have a connection, especially with younger consumers. And you're hearing me 
sounding like a broken record, but it, they're not interested in uh, fragmented portfolios. Um, they're really interested in, in, in companies that have flagship brands and brand families that are successful. So that, that would be my, my advice from the strategic marketing side. You said earlier, you know, you help craft brands get younger. What exactly does that mean? Well, there's, uh, so we go back to the brand identity model at ahead of the curve. Um, so uh, you, that's something that you stand for. What your, what's your point of difference? And it's the DNA of your brand that, that has an opportunity to connect with what younger people are interested in. Um, that, that's a big part of, of what ahead of the curve does. Uh, we spend uh, up to two months uh, digging into it and trying to understand. We have a researcher on our staff as well, another ex cores individual. Um, and so we, we get into uh, the finite items about um, what the company's all about, where there might be a place where we can get younger with consumers. We do the research uh, affordably as well. Um, once we get that solidified and it's collaborative with, with the leadership of the companies, um, then we can go into, hey, do you have the right portfolio for the future? Do we need to innovate? Um, are your brands um, uh, and, and this positioning, um, are they in the right spot to communicate with consumers from the shelf, whether that's bricks and mortar or digital? Because that's your number one item is your, your, your packaging, right? Um, and then from there on, it's tactics. So the e-commerce is where we see young people, right? Um, I think Drizzly's audience is uh, 62 or 64 younger millennials and zennials. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, I have a 15 year old, I can't get them off his phone. Yeah. Um, and they're super savvy. And they, they've been shopping on Amazon and been trained on Amazon. So that's where the future is. So young people, those, those are just, some of the things. Yeah, yeah. So so young people do still drink. Young LDA consumers do still drink because there's yeah. a debate about that, right? <laughs> no, they're definitely drinking. Um, anecdotally, uh, I had a conversation with a, a young man in the financial world, and he said that you know a lot of his friends are 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 exploring THC, and mm -hmm. they're doing that during the week, but the weekends are made for the parties and alcohol. Um, and that really struck a chord with me, but yeah, we're, uh, beverages, uh, adult beverages are competing with lots of things, THC, things of that sort. The only other thing I'd say too, is I think we're seeing a shift from calories to control. Hmm. Um, and there's two C's there, right? There's an alliteration there, but, um, uh, you, 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 you know, there wasn't a phone 10, 15 years ago watching everything you're doing. Um, and now there is, and that's at the party and people don't want to be captured out of control. So that's where I see, I see the low, low Bev, low alcohol and, uh, and NA doing so well. Yeah. Do y'all see that as a lasting trend, the, the NA? Um, I think it's going to have a, a cap, but I don't see it, uh, 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 anytime in the near future. I think it's going to continue to grow. Um, you can see, you know, uh, Spain, the Netherlands, uh, I, th I believe Portugal, they're all double digit share. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's a lot more room to grow. I think we're at the one share, right, of beer. Yeah. Um, so I think it's got a bigger ceiling. So the calories in control, that was uh, that was interesting to me. So is what you're saying is that people aren't necessarily paying attention to the, the, calories. the calorie count? As much as they are just saying, hey, I want one good high ABV beer and then that's it for me. I wouldn't know if it's one or two. It depends on the occasion. And I just said Friday, Saturday nights might be yeah. meant for having more than one. Um, but yeah, I, 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 and don't get me wrong. There's a, a great occasion for 100 calorie products, but I, I definitely see a zest for flavor. And you're seeing it um, with lots of innovation coming out, hard juice being one of them. Um, and, and I think that there's, there's a, an appetite again for, for products that, that have flavor and calories aren't an issue. Right. And I, because I have noticed that, you know, in the seltzer heyday, it was, you gotta be a hundred calories or less. I mean, for, for sure. pretty much any beyond beer, it seemed like, and now they're starting to kind of get back to where maybe they don't even have the <laughs> calories yeah. on the can anymore. Um, that's, that's it. I don't know if I would have to pay you for this advice, but um, <laughs> if you're a craft brewer looking to get into Beyond Beer, would you recommend trying to do that in-house or letting 
the contract producers who know how to do it, uh, would you let them handle that? Well, I, I'm an innovation guy um, and I love innovating, but one, one thing that's a problem or a hurdle uh, with making, um, you know, these highly caloric, flavorful, fruity products is you, you need a special equipment, tunnel pasteurizer being one of them. And that that's that's something that uh, is an investment and it requires space and money. Um, so that's something where um, a lot of brewers aren't going to be able to get into that world unless they have capital. So you're pretty much looking at at working with a third party. I one more follow up from Michael, actually. Uh, Michael, are breweries a newer area of focus for your firm? And if and if so, why come to it now? You know, we've done them historically. Um, we just cover some other industries as well. So with the partnership with Ethan, Ethan, it was more of, you know, we've got a history of distribution, manufacturing, consumer products. Some of my partners did some legacy brewery deals in the day. So it's just yeah. more of just kind of complements our, our service offering. Um, one thing that I would add that I, I didn't mention before is a, a theme that we're seeing just in some of the conversations that we're having is some talks around because, you know, the, the big guys aren't making acquisitions, you know, as often. And there are more conversations about, you know, joining forces and what we call like a merger of equal where right. it's like, hey, we're we're all friends. We all have great products. But why don't we come? Is there a way to come together and benefits of scale and production and, you know, having more strength with the distributors, all those types of things. So, so we are seeing more and more conversations there where, or maybe it's a, a it's an RTD company who's looking to, to merge with a brewery and one has better distribution or the other. And there are ways to, to merge those companies together, sometimes cashless, but you having to figure out exchange ratio and those sort of things. So that's could be an area that we see more activity in at some point in the near future. Do you think things like that might be a little more likely right now than some of the other? Yeah, I mean, we're, yeah. we're having some active conversations yeah. around those, those strategies, what it looks like, you know, who's going to be the survivor or, you know, who's mm-hmm. going to own the majority. I mean, they're, they're complicated. So there's a, you know, a lot of conversations around it. We'll see, you know, if, if those materialize, but that is an area of like, hey, we're, 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 we're great you know, as competitors, but we're probably better together in some scenarios. Well, I think that's all I got. Jen, any more from you? No, thank you gentlemen so much. That was an interesting conversation and we definitely covered a lot, but um, you know, if there's anything we left out that's pertinent. No, thanks for having us on. It's uh, great to be here and it's great to see you guys and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you guys so much. And um, we'll have to uh, do this again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate you having us. Cheers. Thank you, guys.